Hello again, and welcome back uh, to the 13th. Some of you might not know, but this is the 13th Sit and Learn webinar series. You can find our past webinars back on uh, youtube.com slash stand and stretch. Thank you guys for showing up. Today we're going to be talking about retargeting, uh, what it's doing, what it's creating for small business advertising, what are, you know, why are big companies using it more than little companies. I'm going to talk a lot about that today. I'm going to give a couple minutes to some people to show up. Um, looks like we probably have about 30% attendance uh, from who registered. Uh, this, is, this is one of our largest webinars as far as registration, so either kudos to the good marketing or just really good content, I believe. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what's happening with retargeting. I'm going to go over some stats today. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what it looks like. We have a client example. So at Stand and Stretch, we offer retargeting as a service. It does help us provide and look at uh, other marketing opportunities. Uh, it is a it is what we call a um, a complementary um, or a supplemental, more like it, uh, to larger scale things. And today we're going to look at our work with the CS with CSU, uh, Columbus State University is one of our most wonderful clients, and we're going to walk through what it looks like for retargeting, uh, introducing things like paid search combined with a, an amazing critical landing page. Um, <clears throat> but just a few more minutes and we're going to have people kind of coasting in and I don't want to have to kind of go back over uh, a little bit of the intro. So just hang out for a second. I will ask you to look down at your software and you will see a button that says raise hand. Does everybody see it? You can click the button and respond. Yeah, there we go. People are using it. Good job. That's it. A couple times we might use that. Maybe not. Um, it's just a fun tool. <clears throat> we also have some polls that are going to come up. I have five polls. And if you would be so kindly as to, as to fill out the survey when it's emailed to you afterwards, it's very quick. It's all multiple choice. And they're just some general information about uh, the webinar and how we can improve them in the future. So with all that being said, um, I'm going to knock down all the hands. There we go. And it looks like we got a great group of people here. I know most of you, so that's wonderful. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, today, we're going to talk about something very, very important in uh, small business advertising. Uh, retargeting is something that kind of gets tossed around in multiple areas. So I'm just going to dive right in. Um, first, I'm going to uh, <clears throat> get started here by introducing to Prezi. This is the first time we've done a webinar with the Prezi software, so I'm really concerned, and some of the feedback I'm going to ask for in the survey at the end, is Prezi a good webinar software? Um, one of the things I might be concerned with is lag, so please speak up in the chat and say, Lucas, you're going too fast. I have people on our side, organizer here, uh, Tish Freeman, helping out that is going to keep me on pace, and so I get, I get really uh, passionate about this stuff. I talk real fast, and if you could see me right now, I'm waving my hands around in the air like somebody's looking at me, but just how I, I, I function. Um, this webinar is presented by Stand and Stretch. Um, a sit and learn webinar series, and as I mentioned, there are uh, this is our thirteenth one. Um, my name is Lucas Schaefer, and as you see, I'm sort of the principal at Stand and Stretch. I kind of help keep moving things forward as our team is one of probably the most high end production companies for digital and web marketing needs, including website design, uh, all the way to mobile application and advanced marketing tactics. And today, joining us, uh, who just told me five seconds ago that she didn't like her picture. I completely like your picture. It's cool. Um, without Tish operating Stand and Stretch, I don't think I'd be able to do webinars or anything fun. Um, but you see her avatar there. And any time during this, during this uh, webinar, tweet uh, or use Instagram, take a picture of your screen and hashtag sit and learn. That would be much appreciative. Thank you so much. So <clears throat> I'm going to jump right into our first poll. This is fun, it's interactive, and it's a very simple question. So if you would, uh, look at the question that's on the screen, and what are you thinking there? Uh, how many people are currently using retargeting? So as I watch you guys fill up a large percentage of the voting taking place now, um, you know, 
you might have heard this, you might have seen this, you might have participated in this already, you might be using it right now. Um, the key factor is that um, at some point what we end up seeing is a large, uh, I'm going to close this and I'm going to share the poll with you guys so you can see the audience. The audience participation is important in our webinars. Um, <clears throat> a large percent, over half of you, are unaware uh, of what it is. So that's a great thing because today is all about education and learning how to utilize it in your in your business. Um, there's the there's the idea that retargeting kind of came up about five or six years ago um, with Google and some of the high end exchange services that do banners and and things like that. Um, it kind of got mixed in with what we would call behavioral targeting. And behavioral targeting is basically a retargeting mechanism that is found on a singular website. And um, that website would say, okay, if you visited this frequently to the sports section, then we're going to show you targeted ads that are dealing with sports. The retargeting that we're talking about today is a little bit different. The retargeting we're talking about today is very clearly described as us being able to put someone who visits your website into a bucket uh, what we would call a visitor data or a profile. We would put uh, some information on their computer, and I'll go into detail on that. But then when they go to places they visit regularly, like Facebook or a site that uses Google AdSense or the Yahoo Publishing Network, we'll be able to, we'll able to capture that. So I have a lot of analogies. I have some real-time examples. And if you're thinking about uh, <clears throat> on what retargeting is, and please, if there's any time you have a question, notice that there is a question area, a place for you to actually go in and assign um, some questions uh, to us, and we'll, we'll try to answer them. So I have 15 fun facts about uh, retargeting. Uh, some of them are, are very descriptive of what it's doing, but some of them are kind of talking about the exchange platforms. Um, I don't expect everybody to get them all, but I am going to talk about them and try to translate to, the, to my best power. I'm pretty good at translating, but sometimes I'm, a, I'm completely overboard. So the first thing, and one of the things that I really like about um, some of the, the resources, I pulled these resources together and I got the links on there, uh, eMarketer.com saying that nearly three out of five U.S. online buyers say they notice ads from products they looked up on other sites. I love this because it says that uh, basically the retargeting mechanism, when, when somebody visits Zappos.com or Amazon.com, you know, I go to Zappos. I buy shoes off Zappos sometimes. They're, they're really great deals. So if I'm looking for that red Reebok, you know, you know, the one that is a running shoe, and, and but I don't buy it, you know. But I go back to Facebook the next day, and I notice that that red Reebok is actually on the right column over there, what we call the right side conversion area. And in that, you know, this stat is saying that three out of five of those buyers notice that product and ad. So that's something to be uh, – be thought about when you're looking at uh, creating a logo for your company that somebody might visit your website, you might tag them and they go back to Facebook, let's just say Facebook, and, and they see your ad. And when I talk about see your ad, they see your ad persistently over and over and over. And we'll get a little bit de more detail on that. So walking through here, and I hope I'm not going too fast uh, for the screen here, and I'm trying to notice what I'm doing, so bear with me. Uh, in a study that evaluated various strategies and terms of the average lift in search activity generated for an advertising brand, retargeting represented the highest lift in trademark search behavior. So PR Newswire is a really great resource for uh, public relations, and what we're actually talking about here is retargeting represents a highest, the highest lift in the way brands and uh, your trademarks or any type of uh, company business that deal with digital branding or online uh, behavior, even when it comes to banner mentality like billboards and things that are in that zone, um, there is a, a very noticeable lift in recognition and also understanding of those trademarks. Very cool information. Let me see if I can get to the next one here. So 30% of consumers have a positive or very positive reaction to retargeted ads. Now, by a sign of hands, is that true? I mean, when you see a retargeted ad, are you, are you, are you thinking, yes, I love this, or, or is this something that is something that's difficult for you to deal with? Do you think it's a little too creepy? Right, um, that happens. Uh, 
versus the 11% who feel negatively about them. So there are those people that are just like, ugh, I hate them. But, you know, most of the part, what we're seeing here is 59% have a very neutral neutral reaction. And uh, honestly, when you're dealing with passive passive uh, marketing like you would on Facebook uh, with, a, with low returns and people are more interested in their uncle's, you know, birthday than, than trying to buy the red Reebok. So you can kind of see that neutral action. This is one of my favorite ones uh, that has popped up. So I know that uh, every company that we talk to has started to think about adding a dedicated budget for retargeting alone. Uh, you have the companies that are that lean heavily into paid search, that lead lean heavily into boosting posts on Facebook for getting you know because they're heavy in eto you know e-tail or e-commerce retail things that are coming up for this season. You know, it's a good time to think about all of this all these marketing options because if you're in retail or you deal with uh, products that are sell that have high volume of sales during the fall season, um, which is basically Christmas and Thanksgiving and, and all the way up to back to school, you know, one in five marketers now has a, has a dedicated budget for retargeting. We internally serve over two dozen uh, retargeting accounts uh, and managing those, those accounts as well. Cool information at changeo.com. <clears throat> so, Trying to follow my Prezi, make sure that you guys are seeing the same thing I am. You know, among the primary site goals, what we've seen is that there's an additional focus on increasing both site engagement and brand awareness. So you can imagine what retargeting is doing right now for people who are in the consideration of saying, I'm a new company. So if you're a new company and you're working with a platform like retargeting, imagine the uh, the the amount of awareness you can create by having people visit your website for the first time and saying, hey, I want to look at what this company looks like. They visit your site, and then you put this little this little cookie on their browser, and then every site they go to that's a part of the platform and, and the exchange services, which is Facebook, Google AdSense, and the Yahoo Publishing Network, inside of those three frameworks, you're going to have display advertising continually, repeatedly being very persistent and also being preferenced, so you're you're going to get these advertisers that are that are like, uh, for example, the Ledger Inquirer, which I'll show you, actually allows for Yahoo Publishing Network um, to to feed in the the in between areas. Um, significantly, marketers are more likely to use site retargeting to acquire customers. So, site engagement and brand awareness. And what's happening here? You know, we're increasing the focus on both of these. I'm sorry, additional focus on increasing both of the site engagement and brand awareness. These are big numbers because I'm going to talk about a little bit more um, coming up here that sound to me as being a being sort of in the the, the retail web e-commerce marketing field. Um, when you talk about boosting ad response 400%, I call BS. You know, I go, this is not true. That is that is ridiculous stat. We we see stats like. Two to three percent on normal conversions, you know, maybe six on a strategic campaign that has a very, very, very good landing page that has great content, great marketing, great creative. You talk about boosting ad response up to four hundred percent, and this is actually from CMO.com back in 2013. So you, all this information is pretty relevant, less than a year old. Um, we're looking at people seeing ads that they're familiar with. So yes, four hundred percent increase on ad response is an actual detailed number. And if you look at this, if you go to CMO.com and check out this resource, it's got a lot of great information just about e-channel stuff. And CMO is a great, great resource for any marketing material. Um, we're going to see numbers like that. And I'm gonna show, I think I'm going to show you another one here. 40% um, of search engine marketing professionals believe retargeting is the most underused online marketing technology. Now, why is that? You know, why, why do you think that it's the most underused? Um, well, to be frank, this webinar is to educate you on why you should be using online technology like this. Retargeting is just not saturated into the marketing as, as most people don't know what it is because they kind of think it's the old thing that I told you about earlier. It's that behavioral targeting that's that's only built on one website. It's kind of, it's fun to talk about. It's cool that there's this this elaborate network of things that are tracking all this stuff that users are using. That's great. It's also great that you would use that into the growth of your company. But retargeting, as what we're talking about, having people visit your website 
us specializing a cookie that targets them to be put on these other networks like Facebook and Google AdSense and Yahoo Publishing. It's mo it's mostly underused. And again, the stat is from CMO.com. I try not to pull them all from there because you notice that it's the 15 stats of retargeting. <laughs> so I did kind of blend in some, but they had some really great ones that I just really wanted to bring to the attention. Um, and so, you know, we start getting into, well, what does retargeting mean for a lot of other things like email signups and, and uh, conversion rates, CTRs? Well, we're starting to see higher conversion rates. And because uh, in the field of web marketing, you do get aware of that, that uh, you know, 0.09% return on investment for Facebook advertising is extremely low. Um, but people still advertise in a targeted fashion, in a, in a natural uh, targeting fashion uh, inside of the realm of uh, 3 to 5% higher. Um, email retargeting CTRs and conversion rates are anywhere from 3 to 5% higher with upsells as compared to standard site retargeting. So here's that differential. You know, if you're if you're asking outside of the, the realm of uh, basic e-commerce channels, which would be standard site retargeting, internal site retargeting, this external where we're putting ad placements for your products, for your services on other people's sites, and they're being preferenced and they're also persistent. We're gonna talk about that persistence. I'm gonna use the term pinned. And in a pinned ad, it feels like that ad is always there. And everybody right now on this webinar has had that experience where they go to a website and that ad is particularly always there. And you'll notice it because it's something you purchase a lot, it's something you're familiar with. Now you see that and you understand that that tactic is being used uh, by large scale businesses, but it's being underused by small businesses. Um, we are, we, I, I, the only reason I am, I, I feel so confident about how retargeting is affecting small business is because I was able to go to, I was asked to come speak at the, the Small Business Development Center conference up in, up in Athens, and they get together once a year, have a conference, they invite speakers to come and sort of, you know, illuminate things, and I, and I got invited to specifically talk about retargeting and how it's changing uh, small business advertising because A, it's cost effective, it's persistent, which is tough, everything's going digital, right? And then you have the idea that this mentality of retargeting has a really good grip on what some of the tactics of, of e-commerce are, which are CTRs and conversion rates. So you see that uh, email being rolled in here uh, ever so slightly um, to, to provide some of the stat proof for our webinar today. Um, you know, online consumers are open to receiving this stuff. You know, I mean, do you turn your cookies off on your web browser as a show of hands? Does anybody do that? Um, it's very unlikely if we find one to two, three people and a handful of people. Thank you for the one person raising your hand. Let me see if I can see who that is. I'm calling you out, calling you out. No, okay. No, not calling you out. The idea that uh, most people are living the life of a what we call an, a biased uh, web presence, and I, I, I see we have a question here from from one of our webinar um, attendees, Cullen. Uh, asked a great question. He says, "Do you know if retargeting is possible with devices that block third-party cookie tracking?" Um, this becomes one of those things that's outside the range of the retargeting that we sell, that small businesses have access to. Um, in 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 today's market. What we see is that when you with third-party cooking tracking on devices, particularly mobile, um, they're very limited. Matter of fact, they have they there are some policies and standards that they they have uh, shorter life expirations than most other devices. Right now, we offer Facebook Mobile, um, but that's because Facebook has the Exchange program, but it does require the cookie. Now, if you start getting into some expansive, more industrious systems like Google's backend systems, you know the idea is that there is that there is uh, some internal tracking that it goes into privacy policies of software you might install on your phone, and I'd be very interested to know what their tracking parameters are. You know, Google Chrome on your phone, Safari on your phone, while they are web-based and would survive on cookies to allow mobile experiences to be better. If you did turn off those. Uh, um, third-party blocking cook, or, sorry, those, third, those cookies, then you would uh, you would limit yourself to the, not only the experience but to be preferenced in these types of retargeting advertising. And I hope I answered your question well. 
Um, very, very, very interesting question because um, mobile devices are one of the last realms of retargeting only because uh, the ad space is so limited. Uh, you're talking about a little tiny device that has, you know, shown that, you know, advertising has been good but not great, but while the desktop realm is really leading the pack. And I see some people have commented, thanks, thanks Reynolds, for your, for your note uh, about not turning, uh, that you don't turn your, your cookies off. That uh, I live a, a, a cookie-filled life, if I can just hashtag that somewhere, cookie-filled life. Um, the idea that uh, that probably represents the real cookies in, in real life, too. Um, again, back to this a little bit, 25% enjoy them because they remind them of what they were looking at previously. This is really great behavioral uh, information. Uh, people respond better to things that they are, that they are naturally, uh, I've already in top of mind awareness. You know, somebody who's in billboard sales would say that that is key. Um, this is one of those behavioral mechanics that makes marketing even possible. Uh, so we see a lot of percentages raising because of this uh, retargeting uh, opportunity. So let's move right along. And you guys don't feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we're 21 minutes into a 60-minute webinar, and I really haven't even gotten to the details, but this stuff, i got to get to it because I want you to understand that there is an intrinsic value of understanding what these, what these stats are trying to bring to small business, to your business, to your life, because uh, not only are you uh, – part of this already because you're experiencing retargeting but now you're trying to get in the ideas of well, how can we be creative and sell and use this to to create a performance metric for your marketing platform now are you using retargeting what was the goals and outcome of using retargeting is it brand awareness is it increased conversion rates we will talk about some of the some of those goals with with one of our example clients uh, coming up so <clears throat> So this is a great one. <clears throat> Retargeting ads are a convenient way to visit a website users already intended to visit. So if I'm getting married and I visited a, 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 a you know a bridal shop, and then I notice that that bridal shop ad is following me everywhere I go, yeah, I'm going to use it for navigating back to that site because I'm ready to buy that thing. I'm ready to make that decision. I want to do a little bit more research. You know, this uh, this is part of that increase of of ad response that we're talking about, getting in a little bit further, um, and using information. I visit a website; it targets me. I'm cool with it. I'm okay. I'm a, you know, some people might find it creepy. I keep mentioning that, but people that are already intended to buy your services don't mind seeing your ads. You know, there's always that question: I bought something on Amazon, and now I'm seeing ads on it. Um, what is the lifetime of me seeing that ad for something I've already bought? You know, there, that would be something that I would call noise to signal ratio. Uh, all advertising kind of falls into that level of what is actually a high quality opportunity versus a, a low quality. Well, if somebody buys a the product, they're still seeing the branding of that product. Uh, unfortunately, it does get a little bit into that 11% of people who are tired of seeing that, that advertising from a previous stat. I'll take a drink from my water. So, <clears throat> CGMP and uh, a company, uh, Kimberly Clark relies on retargeting, uh, says it's seeing 50 to 60 percent higher conversion rates. I like 50 to 60 percent higher because when you talk about 2 percent, literally 50 percent higher is 3 percent. So we're not talking about like huge increases, but we are talking about increases. Now the idea of conversion rates, it says, well, what is a conversion rate? The conversion rate is the last step. We got them to your website because they have a click-through rate of 20%. 20% um, of the people that the email is sent out to is there. Conversion rate is how many of those people turned into a new business opportunity. Uh, uh, they gave you cash, they paid their payment, their, their deposits in, they bought your service. Um, the, this is an exchange of cash. Um, so in any sense of increasing conversion rates, if you can imagine this, this is a percentage usually, uh, you'll notice that if you increase your per conversion rates to 100%, then technically you're doing amazing. It's unheard of. Nobody converts at 100%. The idea that the average overall in any industry, mostly e-tail uh, e or retail e-commerce, you see them setting most of the, the what I would call those industry standards 
Um, things like MailChimp and Constant Contact report these sort of industry standards in their email marketing th through use of anonymous analytics. Uh, you'll end up seeing that um, you're, if you're looking at a 2 to 3% conversion rate and you get a 50% increase, well, this is a multiplication. This is not an addition. This is a, this is conversion rates usually result in a multiplication of the previous number. So if you had 100 people and you converted at 2%, that's 2. You converted at 3%, that's 3. 100 wasn't a good number, was it? That's not, that sounded that didn't sound good. So you do 10,000 and they convert at 2%. That's a, what 200 to convert at three. That's that's uh, that's 300. So you start getting into yeah, okay. Now we're really increasing 100 new customers for an increase of one percent is uh, is a great way to look at how you're converting your leads, your phone calls, your your website traffic. You know the people who are visiting your your blog and liking that page or sharing it, your Facebook post. Are you converting? Do you have a conversion rate on your Facebook status updates? Probably not. That's the that dead zone is like point zero 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 one percent conversion. You might see high end boutiques, some high end um, uh, so high end cultures that deal with uh, a really high end spend uh, will will convert at that at on off Facebook. Um, moving right along, I think I'm on like number seven. So website visitors who are targeted with display ads are 70% more likely to convert. Now, I don't like adding words like more likely. Um, so I, I did do a little research on this on this stat and before I put it in this, and there is some good data behind it. I, I mentioned the link there, which will be available on YouTube later. You can go grab it, or you can, I'm thinking about making this actual, this actual presentation um, public on Prezi, so that you can go watch it in your own time. And that's one of the great things about Prezi. But this actually made sense once I started reading into it. 70% more likely to convert is basically a statement saying that there is that ad response opportunity. So if we're increasing the, the people that are interacting with your retargeting ads, there is a higher end of conversion rate that comes out of it. Because once you're past a certain point in the, in the marketing funnel, once you're past the web traffic, once you're past the click-throughs, and if you can create an instance where you're creating more opportunities for someone to convert, once they're already a part of a machine, this is saying that they're 70% more likely to convert. I like that stat. So a little bit of education behind it. Um, and I think I might have just backed out of my... Uh, Let's see if I can get back here. There we go. Prezi's not bad. So the average click-through rate of display ads, this is this is rough, is 0.07%. And the average click-through rate for retargeted ads is about 0.7%. Does anybody know how good that is? <laughs> it's literally 10 times better than regular traditional CTR display ads. And 10 times, I like saying words like 10 times, and if you just move that decimal point, simple math says this is 10 times better for retargeting ads. Um, however, uh, click-through display ads are very low on, on return on investment. They're usually good for filling large markets like Atlanta or the Southeast or the national markets. Uh, because there is a good saturation of branding or working on multiple levels with multiple clients on how to how to be local how to be how to be regional and how to be national those those mentalities you start looking at saturation points and this is a really good stat here at DigiDay. I like that one so when looking at more than a billion impressions from 547 advertisers, this is this is for my big guys out there. Oh, I see some names out there that know that know what's going on. Um, the uh, <clears throat> when looking at a billion impressions, which is really not that many impressions if you think about advertising as a whole. Um, 547 advertisers running retargeting campaigns on Facebook Exchange right hand side the news feed, and standard web retargeting. So we're talking about three things, and these are the three things that we're going to be talking about with one of our clients coming up soon. Uh, after just one month, Facebook Exchange news feed, which is the middle column, you guys are familiar with the news feed, accounted for 15% of all clicks, despite having just 0.5% of total ad impressions. So that news feed, that place that we put all of our clients, the number one place we put you on, Facebook is in that news feed. It accounts for the majority of all of our retargeting reports. Uh, it's always the most su substantial. When I show it to you, you're going to say, aha, 
is that that's what I keep seeing that for. That's why that sponsored thing is always there. Um, and Marketing Land has got some data, really cool data to sort of push that uh, a little bit further. Um, so a little bit more, and I'm getting into the high-end stuff like I promised. Click-through conversion rates for retargeted Facebook exchange ads were slightly lower at 9% under web retargeting and 60% lower than the right-hand side conversions. So we're looking at sort of a funnel, and as you kind of go from left to right, you get your Facebook exchange ads were lower at 9% under, and right above the Facebook ads, we have web retargeting. And when I show you the web retargeting on weather.com, on, on ledgerinquirer.com, on some, you know, on uh, I think I have several examples, you'll, you'll see that Facebook, yeah, always has like a lower return on investment for overall advertising. Um, 9% under web retargeting. So web, tar web retargeting is 9% above where we're at, we're at for retargeted Facebook. And then 16% lower than right-hand side. So um, Facebook retargeted ads were still lower than the right-hand side conversion rates. Um, so kind of getting into some, some high-end stuff. Some of you are kind of already back to your Gmail uh, and playing around on Facebook, being retargeted. Um, but we're about to get into some good stuff here. So... What's going on with retargeting? Uh, this is a shameless plug of me and my son Gus, by the way. Um, if I visit a website, so so this is kind of me explaining a little bit about uh, the details of the experience that you might have as the person who's being retargeted. Uh, if I visit a website that has information about video games for kids around three, four years old, that website adds a cookie. Now, a cookie is one of those things that have been always sort of the the illusion of, of of taking the cookie and hiding it away has always been this um, this goal. People are turning off cookies; they're disabling JavaScript. That's kind of like back in the ni late '90s, where JavaScript could literally access your computer. Today's experience, right now, today's use of what we would call uh, the immersed rich media experience on most web browsers are now safe. You know, we talk about safety as sort of an asymptotic approach of 99.9%. Um, it just happens to be the same percentage of birth control. Um, so a website cookie to the computer's browser, usually done by a company like Stand and Stretch, um, we, we don't actually create the cookie, but we have the software and the, and the script that does it. It's great. They know exactly what I want, and they know where I am, but they don't know who I am. They don't know that I'm Lucas. They don't know that I, that I have kids. They don't know anything that's sort of arranged into my personal private life, but they do know one thing. They can see all my other cookies, right? So we have Facebook going through the problematic privacy issues of saying, hey, we're also, guess what? And we're not going to look at our cookies. We're going to look at all your other cookies. Well, the crazy thing is Google's been doing that for five years. So it's all this uproar about Facebook and privacy, and we're like, well, Google, you know, and all these other network sites that use cookies and utilize them, like Amazon.com. I mean, how else do you know they know that you need to buy that thing on it when you go to Amazon.com? Those referral models, those cookies are tracking you. Uh, there's a great TED talk about uh, about cookies and and how that we're all being tracked anonymously. Like the it's like called the faceless amoeba. And if you look at it, there's like this enormous network of billions of nodes that are connecting people across the world because of sites they might have visited or cookies that are remnant. Every, once a year, every six months, you should clear out your cookies. It's just a, a good practice. Some cookies aren't built well by bad programmers. Um, so that tagging that I'm talking about here is literally the mechanism that uh, we're going to be calling retargeting. So it's a little bit different than what you see on on, uh, on on sites that do targeting on the site, like behavioral targeting, things like that. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So why is this important? You know, it's important because now I'm part of a subset of a DMA. Uh, if you're in marketing right now or you're part of a marketing um, uh, and, you know, part of your business or you, you are in a marketing department for a larger business, designated marketing areas are something that should have been drawn out in your business plan. Who are you serving? Who's your audience? And most of the times you say everybody, and that's not true. If you've written your business plan, you know that there's a very, there's a very surefire designated set of things, you sh of people you should be pitching to. Um, the cool part about retargeting is there's no regional boundaries. So we don't have to worry about people in Columbus. We don't have to worry about people in, in, and uh, um, thanks, Reynolds. All right, Reynolds is gone. Uh, my anonymous profile is now inserted into a preferential marketing model that limits noise in the ads areas. In ad areas providing me reminders to things I've shown interest in. Um, so this is great because I could be in Seattle, Washington, 
about to move here to Fort Benning looking for a home uh, and, I, and I land on a, a realty company's website and they target me and next thing you know they're in Seattle Washington seeing my advertising all over the place I mean you're not wasting cash like marketing in Seattle because that's just ridiculous right who has that kind of budget and that's why the small business wins in this retargeting scenario um, so you put the scenarios like that together and you say, okay, well, wow, I get it. Retargeting is actually an opportunity for me to get to people who are actually interested or have been or have already preferred me. And so we started talking about pre preferential marketing. I don't even know if we kind of came up with that. I think I Googled it once and nothing came up. But this preferential marketing model does limit the noise. So we're not getting those impressions that are wasted. Every impression that is served in retargeting is served to somebody who has visited your website. You know, and that mentality is great because we're finding the right people with the right ads in the right places. It doesn't matter what your product or service is. Somebody's visiting your website right now, right? Hopefully. You know, if they're not, then we need to have a whole other webinar about web design, search engine optimization, and how to get found in today's online market. And I, just, I should have just wrote that down. Um, the idea here is that we want to be... Uh, thinking about these places where our consumers are and whether they're B2B or B2C. You know, we, we deal with retargeting with, a, uh, with B2, B2B because we deal with wholesalers who are looking for other business owners. And what better way to you know, sell your product to somebody who's, who's going through a list of, of categories of other people who do the same thing you do, but now you're bombarding them. You, you know, you're, kind of, you're, you're everywhere now that they've visited your website to find out more information about your team, things like that. If you're selling products, and especially if you're selling e-commerce level products, retargeting is just a, a no-brainer. Uh, people are going to find your product, be referenced through social media, and they're going to find your blog, and they're going to visit your site, and guess what? The platform we have uh, provides 90 days. In the, the, if they revisit your site, that cookie gets refreshed. So I hate that Reynolds left because we're about to get to the, to the live example. Um, be sure to uh, – you know, I think I might have missed a poll here. I don't know. Maybe, maybe one's coming up. Okay. With smaller sets of profiles – Oh, so we have a question here. Um, thank you, Amy. So I, I cannot see your screen, so I apologize. Let me see if I can write you a little answer real quick. No, sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, so with smaller sets of profiles to market to, you can understand that if you're not marketing to a, a, an 11 million uh, person DMA like Atlanta, I hope you're not marketing to Atlanta, um, with smaller sets of profiles, because what we're actually doing is when people web into your website, we're actually collecting this data as profiles, and they're anonymous. We don't know who they are, but what do we know about them? They know that they want your service or have made uh, uh, some type of uh, assumption that they've visited your website or they've done something that, that uh, um, has triggered them to come to your website. They, they've used your business card. They've used these things, you know, um, to get to your site, direct traffic, search traffic, whatever it might be, organically showing up at your doorstep. We now have them a part of your profile set. Um, small businesses are spending way less money showing impressions only to people who have shown interest in their service or product. So there's one problem that, that, that kind of spins out of this that we, that we try to answer. When I talked about uh, retargeting as being supplemental, uh, you'll get why in just a moment when you notice that little airplane at the bottom left. We're going to fly into our client example. Fly, yeah, it's because it's cool. Um, most retargeting software costs are related to one-time installation of script, we need at least 500 people visiting your website a month, which is kind of complicated if you have a small business that deals with B2B or if you're dealing with a low-end new website that doesn't have good search engine optimization or, or something that might be um, less preferenced. You might not have a large audience. Um, and that, that does happen. And, the, and, a, and, a, and at $100 a month. Now, this is kind of uh, on your own, in, the, in your own world. Now, that's what you might charge, and I'll talk a little bit about who you might want to go talk to, but it's always great to have a company like us building the creative, working on a strategy, working on the message, getting that brand right, because if you're going to be persistently showing your brand across um, you know, the web, Facebook, Google, you know, on Forbes.com, Pandora, Weather.com, all the way through Ledger Inquirer, you know, we're going to be looking at trying to make sure something works and fits a goal that we can help set for you. But nothing like seeing your ads persistently. This is also a behavioral mechanism. You're going to visit your site. You're going to tag yourself, even if you just do it accidentally. And then you're going to start noticing your advertising following you around everywhere. I have this thing where I go through the pitch process where I say, you know, 
you know, right now I don't I don't see any natural advertising. I only see our clients advertising, and it's very true. It's probably very true for Jeanette, who controls our, our advertising and does a really great job uh, helping with the SEO strategy and, and building creative um, uh, and getting you know reports done, which is an amazing uh, opportunity to work with us on that just that level alone. Uh, you see this. Uh, you see this client reaction there is a behavioral mechanism behind the client actually seeing their ads all the time you can't drive by the billboard every day and be like look there's my billboard I love my billboard you know but this the world if you're digital if you're online if you're seeing this you know they seeing these ads they do make you feel good before we jump in I see I have another question down here so Cullen yes my example that I'm about to go through your, your question is right on point right good timing um, uh, Colin asks, he says, have, have we combined retargeting with marketing automation, like using retargeting cookies to combine with dynamic content? So not so much as getting into the dynamic content, but more into the lines of using um, uh, critical landing pages and uh, email remarketing campaigns, sort of like a nurtured lead service, uh, and that's what I'm about to show you. Uh, however, um, dynamic content with cookies can be in, in some of our larger platforms. Uh, what you're actually going to be thinking about is most of these platforms like AdRoll or Perfect Audience, they actually use what, what's called a segment. Um, and if we say that you've landed on Stand and Stretch, and I have this example coming up, if you go to standandstretch.com, which is our main website, it shows all of our services, pretty much everything, a little bit about our culture, a little bit about our people. Um, it's a great, cool homepage, but if you venture into our web design page, which is literally a different URL structure, so we have standandstretch.com slash web design, um, ad roll and perfect audience, these are, and most of all the retargeting platforms available, can segment that profile into only seeing web design ads. So you see this being used on a large scale with Amazon, all the way down to every single product they offer as an independent ad. Um, they do a lot of crunching to get that look serialized. There's not a lot of creative more than there is software to serialize and create this industrious platform of all these segments. Every every single product has its own segment. That is way expensive, way out there in large business land. Um, small businesses using retargeting as a platform for static content, maybe just your brand or logo, is a great way to introduce yourself to this market platform. Now we do have clients that are in, uh, in sort of the, in, in the that work inside of law, or that have multiple products, and that when somebody lands on that independent product, they stay a preference to see that segmented um, ad more. So you can kind of see you can diversify um, deeply into the retargeting platform and create segments that do handle dynamic content. Um, the marketing automation combined with dynamic content is a little different. Usually, usually we deal with small businesses who aren't looking for an enormous amount of automation because it can get expensive and it turns into recurring cost. Um, things that would be sort of custom built, like email templates and things that are like that. So, it's a great question, Colin. Um, I think I can even uh, sort of add to that as a compliment uh, the example that I'm about to show you now. So, thank you. And of course, anybody has any questions, please uh, please feel free. We're about to fly over here to our wonderful client um, at Columbus State. So it's a great opportunity to be doing these things on such a level that uh, the the feedback, you know, we start talking about feedback loops and and success criteria and things that that drive marketers batty and and make them happy and charge them up with some coffee and they'll start talking about conversion rates that are just they just love talking about stuff like that. But you know, our work with Columbus State here is just really just a great opportunity because when we start talking about things and what Colin was, was mentioning is all this retargeting, all of this uh, paid search, all these inbound marketing opportunities need a place to land. Um, landing pages are becoming known for as being you know sought after, developed wisely, search engine optimization, very dedicated to you know increasing quality scores so you can cut paid search in half. Um, this is our landing page that we actually designed for uh, Columbus State. Uh, with a little help with our UITS group, uh, we were able to put this together, get a form that was dedicated to this, a downloadable PDF. And of course, um, Kate has been a wonderful representative for us to help us out. I do see that I missed a poll, and I'm going to uh, say that it's it's not my fault. So here's another poll. Um, 
let's just see here. So <clears throat> this is probably a little bit back in the in the back. So have you experienced this type of preferential marketing? This is probably right around where I was talking about coining the phrase preferential marketing. Um, so as you kind of, kind of talk about this, if you're not sure, you know, it's a very clear way to find out. Go to Facebook and do you recognize any of the ads on the side? Go to go to Forbes.com, look at the advertising. Are you recognizing any of that advertising? So this is really good. Um, looks like there's over 50% of you have voted. So click the little button, make it happen. I'll close it in two seconds. One, two, good. Thank you, guys. So this is great because... A large percentage of you guys that there is 78 percent of you that have that are very familiar with preferential marketing that are um, understanding of what what it what is doing it to your life <laughs> um, some of you know that that's that's okay not sure again go to Facebook or if you don't have Facebook that's fine go to weather.com which is a site I visit daily you know I got to know whether or not I'm wearing shorts or jeans you know whether it's starting to, it's going to start to change soon um, I'm going to move right directly into the third poll and this is great because this is uh, very very cool so if you're still on there I see everybody's kind of looking at their screen right now so please um, answer this poll do you have a website or a critical landing page uh, currently most people have a basic website and they send most of their traffic to their home page right that's a very typical thing you know there's the idea uh, that there's some and we and we have a couple people not seeing the poll. Um, just give it just a few moments to maybe it'll pop up. Um, we do have people answering the question, so sorry, Jill, you're just in the dark. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure some of the people some people aren't seeing it either. And if you're not, uh, please be patient. It might pop up in a minute. Uh, we have over 75% of the people filled out the poll right now. I'm um, going to close it and let's see what the results are here. Looks like most of everybody in this uh, in this webinar has a basic website. Uh, Sixty-two percent of you have said that you know I'm using a site that's probably several years old. Maybe there's an opportunity for us to to help you kind of upgrade or or get something that's high that's a better performing engine for most of your marketing. Um, also, uh, um, I see that there's a, a performance based website with landing pages. So a third of you are, are crushing some CTRs and looking at conversion rates, right? And cross referencing it with your Google Analytics and putting the buttons that need to be pushed all together so that you have a framework and understanding how your dollars are spent. If you're not doing that, we can definitely help out with that. Um, nobody has a really old website. <laughs> and then what is a website? Thank you for the, the person with that. Um, so we're, we're launching into this public uh, campaign uh, and talking a little bit about uh, some of the fun stuff we're doing at CSU. Um, diving into, uh, let's get rid of the poll here. Thank you for your submission. And we're kind of moving along here with uh, the idea that once you have a great landing page, sometimes it becomes important to understand how you're you're focusing and getting traffic to that site. So in many cases, all of our clients, including the law firms we work with, the, the retail, the manufacturing, there's always an assumption that paid search is driving better traffic, qualified leads to your website that are going to allow you to drive traffic and you utilize, as in a large scale, an opportunity for you to create higher conversion rates and go through a better conversion process. You know, this funnel is something that you should become very, very clear with. Um, you know, you're focusing on things to get you found, ads to be put out there, landing pages becomes the best thing, website navigation. You know, one of the things we talked about um, with with the landing pages of all of our clients inside of uh, having something structurally built at sound is that when we get to, have you ever checked out at Amazon and gotten to the checkout page and ever noticed any other button than the checkout button? Right? No, it doesn't exist. Check it next time. There's no nav. There's no anything. There's nothing that can deter you from creating that conversion right then, right there, except the back button on your browser. And so we start thinking about mentality of landing pages the same way. Really, there's only two things to do here. Pick up that phone and call that number and, or fill out that information. And by the way, some of our services include high-end uh, call services like Callfire. Really great company, really cheap and expensive. We can get you a phone number for everything you do, your a billboard, your business card, your your postcards, your website, anything that might be uh, information for you. You can, you can receive text from it. 
you can do voice surveys. We really don't we really don't have any um, <clears throat> what I say what I mean is we, we really have all these options and we, we try to utilize them as far as we go. Um, in this case we're we're utilizing call fired so we can look at who's calling. I mean what better measurement of success than to know that the billboard that you use with that phone number that we're tracking and it auto forwards instantaneously so there's no like across the board. Um, but it, it's very nice to know that 19 people you know called your phone that and today that used you know your website landing page and that's great it's also good to know that maybe one person used the billboard um, so you start looking in that that mentality and you can start making your own uh, references and that's and that's from familiar way so once they land here so we talked about how do we get them to the, land, the landing page so we could use paid search general marketing uh, uh, we would talk about print uh, organic search which is which is very good um, this is the tag. It's kind of jumbled. I guess it's kind of zoomed in a little bit too much. Most people don't understand what it is either, anyways. But this tag is actually a piece of the smart pixel that gets put on your website. And without this tag, the cookie does not get created. And when that cookie gets created, it only lasts for 90 days. So we have no control over that. It's actually part of the system we use. But lo and behold, if you're part of the internal inbound marketing for that landing page, once you hit that landing page, man, we got you. And we got you good. You know, I go back and I'm looking at Facebook. So this is me. All right, I'm looking for this program, this service, this product. And then, bam, I go back to Facebook. And here it is, very clear that in the middle of the page, you see um, the news feed. Remember I said that the news feed ad was the, most, uh, was the most popular. It had the best response and the highest conversion rates. And as you can see very clearly, with the branding, the summertime, the, the feeling of the College of Business in Columbus State, being a large part of trying to grow their platform, their, their awareness for their platform across the states. And so we're imagining this in the sense of, you know, if somebody from Washington, D.C. might have visited the online CSU's program. And, and so we're not targeting to the entire Washington, D.C. That one singular person is now seeing something very similar to this. Um, if you also notice on the right side over there, in the right side conversion area, you'll see another ad. So wow, so we're we're really multi-platform, multi-space, multi-ad strategy here. Um, same branding, same particulars. Uh, we're trying to get into that summer mode, trying to get, ramp everything up for the fall semester that's just launching right now. Uh, that becomes a, a big thing. You know, I put the pin on it. The pin, it, it exists there because I want you to realize that as you're rolling down Facebook, you might see this ad twice or three times if you're one of those people who sits there for 30 minutes like myself. You know, I will lose 30 minutes of a day real fast. Um, well, the characteristic is I might refresh this page and come back tomorrow. Same ad, same thing looking at me right in the face. Now, we do, multi we do multiple types of ads, and so I'll show you a couple of those things here um, as I show you an example. Here's an up close of the, uh, of the, of the ad there. Um, very cool. A lot of, lot of things being thrown around there. It's a little blurry. I think Prezi is probably not going to be my next choice for the next webinar. But here again at the bottom of the weather.com page, boom, CSU, following me on, on weather.com, right? You see it there. And then boom again on another page, different on weather.com. You know, and it's very peculiar if, if, I'm, if I'm trying to feel like I want to be a part of a university system. The clock tower is a very huge icon. I got to visit a couple. Of, uh, I got to visit Rome and there, that there, West, West, uh, West Georgia. That they were in the Grange and Carrollton area. That they, everywhere I went, it was kind of clock tower city, very iconic. Um, not only that, but check that out. We are putting um, ads on Ledger Inquirer. You know, the, to fill the space of their direct sales team. That we've, uh, we've literally had to, uh, you know, go back door and put ads on the Ledger Inquirer site for pennies. On the thousand impressions, which we're getting up real quickly to how much does all this cost? So if you've ever been approached by Ledger by a platform uh, of direct sales, and they have a they have a very strong strategy at direct sales and what we would say um, static content, uh, locking down a page, page takeovers. But when they can't sell all of their real estate, all of their what we call properties or inventory. Um, they use um, the Yahoo Publishing Network to fill in those holes. Well, our retargeting platform that we sell puts it out there, and guess what? It's persistent. It shows up every every other time. And if you've ever bought advertising on websites and waited for your 
your your ad to show up, it, it kind of gets a little hairy. So that, that ad is persistently all over the online. For me, it's all over Ledger. It's all over Forbes. It's all over Pandora uses these, these networks. So as you kind of go into these publishing sites that you might use regularly, you know, Fast Company, um, you'll start seeing advertising shown like this preference to your clients who have visited your site. And again, here down on the bottom of the ledgers, uh, I think this is still the ledger, yeah, deal, deal of the day stuff. But here's a different ad. So now we're now we're looking at different ad structures. We're looking at different uh, branding, trying to trying to get into you know they're seeing our ad all the time at a lower rate because they have been preferenced for our advertising. With all that being said, you know achieving the critical six factors have been momentous for us. Um, We've seen this not only improve the internal sales with us, but when retargeting is paired with a paid search platform and a, a new custom website or a better landing page or a uh, lead nurturing or, or automated marketing service, uh, and then combined even as far as going into high-end retargeting with, with the dynamic content that Colin mentioned about bringing together, you know, if they go to my web design page, they get web design ads. If they go to my retargeting page, they get retargeting ads. If they go to my, my, my plumbing site, if they go to my real estate site, if they go to anything, and there's segments in those businesses, we can show them those particular ads to increase the uh, uh, critical success factors, which is ultimately driving traffic, improving conversion rates. And if you apply that to anything in your business, I bet everybody right now on this webinar could say something to the fact of, I need something to be improved. And can we do it online? You know, that's what we want to work with you guys and try to figure out. So let's button up some things here. I see it's four minutes left. And I feel good about that. Um, so impact, what is the big deal with retargeting? Well, a lot of us have the mentality of we've used traditional marketing in the sense of billboards, digital print, radio. Um, you know, we, we all knew social media was coming. It kind of settled, and we're looking at what's left. And there's always a good mix of marketing. You know, there's always a good idea to do some radio, some TV, some, you know, some something out there. Do some print, do some new business cards, do a little piece, and share it with a company. Um, and Matt, this is the kind of thing I want you to think about. Retargeting feels like this in a traditional marketing world. Imagine if every customer that came into your store walked out into the street, and every billboard was your ad. You know. Imagine imagine that every billboard is now suddenly transformed. Maybe they're digital boards, <laughs> and maybe they know that they're being looked at by somebody who just left your store. Well, every radio station is now filled with advertising that's related to your business. Every magazine page shows some place on there you're advertising. It might not be up front. It might not be on the top half, what we call above the fold, but it's, it's there. It's showing. It's persistent. Um, that persistence is winning. Um, tailored advertising is changing to the, the way marketers present campaigns to clients. Market voice is now more about getting your consumer and not every consumer. So that's a that's a very very good statement to say that you know in in any idea of what we're trying to do with our services and trying to be on the technology technology frontier and the marketing frontier of what we offer, uh, retargeting has become a platform that we we couldn't get away from because other people were doing it and we just had to do it better. So I challenge you guys to come and visit us and talk to us a little bit about it. You know, the Facebook exchange is one of the things I brought up as an ancillary note. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about perfect perfect audience and ad roll. We've, we've kind of seesawed a little bit about those, but you know, basically we usually start something at about 250 a month to manage. Uh, there's a $25 a week minimum. So you gotta think about that. Okay. Um, the minimum number of profiles that resets after 90 days. You have to keep 500 people in your profile data. We looked at some of the ads that we've rolled and we put together some costs. Uh, there usually is some increase on level things. Our ads ran a little bit softer. The standard stretch ads have been running for probably nine months. They, they haven't been tweaked or catered or segmented. They've been very general. We only put a minimum amount into them uh, and we're running them at a very low rate and they, they're not getting any clicks. So I'm going to show you what that kind of looks like, what you should expect in reports from us and things that might show positive uh, gain on brand exposure or even uh, conversion rates if your e-commerce are based on service-driven uh, marketing. Uh, impressions are about 88 cent per thousand, so just go leverage that somewhere. It's probably about twice to three times the amount of traditional targeted advertising. The cool thing I would say about that is those thousand people, those, those, those I'm sorry, those impressions are people that already are preference for your service, have visited your website, already shown interest in your products. 
Um, clicks are around two dollars for us, but we've seen other clients go into things that are like twelve dollars, seven dollars, five dollars. It's always good to look at a benchmark campaign, a ninety-day platform that says, okay, we're going to run retargeting for ninety days. How much are we spending? And then ramp it up, ramp it down. And not all clients are the same. We we understand that marketing uh, happens for most companies in this third, fourth quarter, while some other companies survive well in the summer. And so we always have these ideas of of making sure we do the right thing. Not always spending the same amount of money uh, during the period, changing creative every ninety days. And we have twelve month platforms where we can do on demand creative um, and working that that angle as well. I'll show you a couple of examples here. So this is a long-term uh, impression ratio. So we're looking at somewhere around, I'd say about 50, 60 impressions a day of people seeing stand and stretch advertising during this period. It's very cool. Um, these impressions are based on uh, how many times people are seeing our ads. You know, we have, uh, we have our, uh, oops, I think I skipped one. So what does that look like, Lucas, in terms of this? Uh, how much money did you spend on this? And this is why it's so Amazing, you know, we didn't, we don't have any clicks, and the reason why that you know this is so low, you'll see the 429, uh, is because we have zero clicks. In many scenarios, we want to have clicks. So when you start introducing the two, three dollar clicks, the ten dollar clicks, um, you start seeing the spend come up, and this is actually a weekly uh, impression ratio. So, so that's pretty cool information. You can see, you know, talk to other advertisers. You really kind of want to wrap this together. Um, with paid search and a good website design. Um, so these are the ads you might see if you visit Santa Stretch today. Uh, you visit our website and you'll get a good chance at looking at uh, these ads on the right-hand conversion area. And I see that I have a poll. And it's 101, so please, 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 please take this poll. I'm going to launch it real quick, um, see if I can keep you for, for two more minutes. What type of mediums are you currently using for marketing? You know, this is great because this is a good idea of, of how we'll close it out today. We do yellow book and billboards. We do radio. These are all multiple choice, so just select all you can. Go down the list. Uh, we do digital. We do social media, online ads, paid search. Uh, we put things in the mail. I just put that in there because I thought it was funny. Uh, we are actually about to look at uh, the USPS as a good service for doing every door direct uh, EDD. Their program is, looks pretty great. Um, we'll close this out. Looks like we have a good amount of people. Um, I'll share this with you. This is cool information. I like this. So we have uh, a, lot, a lot of people doing social media, online ads. That's great. Uh, we have no marketing strategy. Okay, I see that. Um, you know, and, of course, these are aggregate. People have selected these multiple choice. Um, multiple answers were allowed. So a lot, a lot of people are still putting things in the mail. I'd like to have that conversation about what we, what we see as success factors for it. Um, okay, let's move right along. I'm keeping you guys, and I apologize for that. Um, Going into this, uh, is it worth it? You know, we talk about this. Is it worth it? Uh, what's the what's the cost? You know, is it low enough to fit inside your monthly budget? Is it? Go are you going to have 500 people visit your site in the first 30 days? One of the criteria is that we have 500 visitors at your profile data, um, so that we can launch the campaign and it get approved. So in some cases, there's a two to three to four week staging process just to get the platform up. So start today. Have have that conversation today. Um, brand persistence is absolutely worth it. Even if you just have your your logo floating out there at our at our lowest uh, cost, and somebody visits your website and guess what they see your 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 stuff on Facebook, you know that might work. And if you're a boutique, that's a great place to be. If you're another service that that most of your markets on uh, looking at Ledger Inquirer or all these other platforms, then yes, you know that that's going to work as well too. Uh, Multi-platform. We're working with Facebook, Google AdSense, and Yahoo Publishing. And if you don't, if you don't know, Google AdSense and Yahoo Publishing network take up 94 of banner ads in the all of the web world, the interwebs. Um, so that's a very interesting fact that we can actually support 94% of display advertising um, is done by the two platforms we actually use. Um, emotional behavior. Gosh, it's so good seeing your advertising, your own advertising out there. Um, that that becomes a really big big part, but the you know the real question is you know and some people have a lot of problem with this you know is this too creepy you know I I think that it it might be for some people you know there's a, there's a comfort level there's a factor going into this that says yeah you know, hey I'm going to be serving very particular ads to you and that is going to become the way that I'm sort of tracking you from our website um, I have another poll here it's the last one and then we're going to close out. Um, Let's see what it says. 
do you plan on taking the next step and come in for a cons consult? You know, maybe it's a good maybe it's a good answer here. Um, following up with me in an email is even better. Lucas at standingstretch dot com having that having that conversation with us and and just getting started. There is the factor that you're not going to come in uh, for a consult. I get it. It's cool. You're already doing something amazing, awesome. You know, but just want to kind of prime me and say you should come in and talk to us. There's no charge to come in. Looks like we had a lot of maybes there. It was pretty cool. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. So let's see. We got one more slide here, and then we're done. And let's see. There's the creepy slide. And uh, thank you for your time. And that's it, guys. My name is Lucas Schaefer. That little guy is Gus. Uh, reach out to me at Lucas Schaefer. I'm sorry, Lucas at standingstretch.com. Have a great day. And the stop sign is relevant. Um, you can follow up uh, at youtube.com slash stand and stretch and get you some some old webinars. Like I mentioned, this is the 13th of a series called Sit and Learn Webinar Series. And in that case, uh, I appreciate all your time today. And uh, thank you for your interaction. There's going to be a survey that's going to be emailed to you immediately after this. Please take it. It's five questions. There's, if you don't answer, it's going to follow up in a couple of days to try to get you at a better time. So thanks for spending your lunch with us at Stand and Stretch. Thanks for having times. Um, no, Maddie, there's, there's no swag. Uh, I wish I did have some swag. Uh, I could send you some email swag afterwards. 